Hello and welcome everyone. This is going to be a slight change of pace as I will be taking on a classic debunk. As you are probably aware, I did a thing with Planner Walk about this guy. Well, no, actually this guy. We had talked about doing that video a few months ago and decided to pick it up again. But to refresh my memory, I had to watch the video again and it was quite hard to find on his channel as he puts out a lot of nonsense like this. They're not forces, they're acceleration. Acceleration is the complete opposite of a force. Another reason why I got interested in this guy is that a few flat earthers and electric universe nutters have mentioned Ken Wheeler in my comment section, and it happens to be this guy. Now, flat earthers bringing Ken Wheeler up is funny, as the electric universe flat earthers seem to hold him in high regard, even though Ken Wheeler is definitely not a flat earther and will regularly take the piss out of them. But he is still an idiot, so I take the piss out of him. Fuck did you just say? Much of his channel is focused on photography, but he also dabbles in magnetism in roughly the same way as dictators dabble with democracy. Now, I don't know much about photography, and what he has to say on that subject may very well be sound. I don't know. But I do know a bit about magnetism, and on that subject he is completely lost. However, he seems to think that he is the greatest mind in history to ever address the topic, and he felt compelled to share his knowledge through a six-part lecture series out of the kindness of his heart, and also to get you to purchase his book with the pithy title Uncovering the Missing Secrets of Magnetism, Exploring the Nature of Magnetism with Regards to the True Model of the Atomic Geometry and Field Mechanics by Means of Rational Physics and Logic. Available at Amazon for the small price of £7.37 for the Kindle edition. So let's have a look at what he has to say in this um, inspiring lecture series, and we will start with lecture one. Okay. I'd like to uh, start out by presenting this lecture. I don't know if it'll be seven or eight sections, but um, I'll uh, do two sections a day. And uh, I need to preface this by stating that the first two sections um, are not, uh, will not be going into specifically magnetism and what defines a magnet and a magnetism, but a preface. And then secondly, so the current state of what modern science believes magnetism is. So. Oh, okay. So for the first two videos, you weren't really touching your ideas. Maybe I should just skip them. Now, even from your phrasing, I know full well that you are going to fuck this one up. Uh, for those of you who might complain, and this was not part of my original lecture, um, the first and second sections will be prefacing things that many of you probably are unaware of, and then I will be going, starting in section three, into directly magnetism, incommensurability, polarity, what defines a magnet, what defines magnetism, incommensurability. Okay, this word will be popping up a lot. I can't be bothered to edit the following clip into the video every time he says that word, so I will ask for a bit of audience participation and ask you to imagine this every time he says the word. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Now, incommensurable is the inability to judge two things by the same standards, as in they cannot be measured in similar ways. It has nothing to do with how he uses the word. There is also a definition in mathematics, and this pertains to two numbers being incommensurable if the ratio between the numbers is an irrational number. It is also funny how he claims that this is a difficult word, and he uses this word at least 51 times in his book. Yet, he spends no time actually defining it. So this is section one, and this is a preface. So, if you could bear with me. <laughs> I'll be able to go a lot slower pace, too, um, than the, uh, the limited time slot that I was uh, allowed for my lecture. Um, I uh, spoke rather rapidly, and uh, I'm used to speaking quickly. Oh, you were used to speaking quickly? Uh, please, can you start doing that, then? This is illustrated uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. This is the Divina Proporzione. 
Ah, he's a pretentious dickweed as well. Oh, cool. There are a lot of actual diagrams in this of space and counter space. Space and counter space. Hmm. I've never, never heard of the term counter space before, so let's look it up. I'm sure that there's a joke in there somewhere. If you think of one, then stick it in the comment section. But I mainly pause it here as this looks like there will be a lot of nonsense. So I will warn you that this may take some time. I can assure you as a translator of ancient Greek and Prakrit that uh, as well as ancient Egyptian, I don't translate ancient Egyptian. Yeah, using Google Translate doesn't make you a translator. Considering the amount of times that I have seen you try to translate words from ancient Greek to modern English without realizing that the words were actually Latin. Every ancient Greek translator, too, has had a hard time translating incommensurability. I know exactly what the fuck incommensurability is. I somehow doubt that you can translate shit. But do you see what I mean? There's going to be a lot of stops and starts here. Maybe I should employ some uh, movie magic. The, uh, the false door of the Egyptians and several other um, uh, symbologies and, uh, and the metaphysical uh, premises exist with the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks, and the ancient Indians as far as counter space, talking about a non-Cartesian nexus from which uh, everything springs. It is the case that uh, from macro to micro, everything is mirrored in Mother Nature. I mean, you uh, sprang from uh, a hole in your belly button. Motherfucker! <laughs> what? We uh, experience life through various uh, portals and orifices, nose, mouth, eyes, ears, the, uh, the black of the eye. Um, this notion of counter space being something new, and of course, when it pertains to Mother Nature, it doesn't make any difference. We say counter space, we say zero point energy, we say uh, um, vacuum energy, you know, we say the ether, Mother Nature, and I'm not personifying Mother Nature uh, in reality, I'm just using it for happenstance of saying Mother Nature. It doesn't care what uh, pathetic human beings conceptualize it as, as means of verbal communication, and I certainly myself cannot care whether someone says zero point energy or, or the ether or the vacuum, but uh, this premise of counter space, this uh, non Cartesian, this uh, actually uh, pre-Cartesian, non-Euclidean. Pre-Cartesian. Now he really is a fan of just saying things. Cartesian is not a time period, if that's what you were thinking. It's just a name we give to the basic coordinate system that we use on a daily basis. Uh, premise of counter space is ancient and nothing new nor contrived uh, whatsoever. This image is courtesy of Michael Snyder. I thought you'd find this uh, funny. This is a uh, several magnets used underneath the feral cell to create a smiley face. Now, okay, that is pretty cool. Um, nothing I discuss in this lecture will fundamentally run contrary to the well-established electrical theory of the greatest minds such as Faraday, Steinmetz, Oliver Heaviside, James Kirk Maxwell, or Tesla. While I myself have been completely interested in understanding magnetism in its entirety for sake of understanding it alone, I have helped several people on multiple fronts, namely using arrayed magnets and gold sluicing devices to extract more gold, as well as radical results in plant growth using magnetism and applied magnetism to alter seed germination and juvenile plant growth. Um, I have a couple other devices of my own, including a, uh, a free invention which I'll never have to call another plumber again. Oh, do you have magic healing crystals as well? It's, uh... Uh, mundane, so I'm certainly not interested in theory for sake of theory alone. However, wisdom and comprehension of the nature of magnetism has always been of paramount importance to me, and I certainly started out early in life saying that the only thing I'm interested in is uh, wisdom. Um, a giant mass of observation, experimentations, and descriptions exist about magnetism, as well as atomistic theories about the same, but descriptions are not explanations. And the convoluted nonsense around magnetism both paints Mother Nature incredulously as a psychotic lunatic, but also affronts credulity, and is a profane insult, premise-wise, to Occam's razor. Hmm, maybe I should go to Ikea and have a look at some kitchens. I'd like some more counter space. In the distance and what mediates it has never been explained. We use, replicate, make, and utilize magnets in every corner of the earth, yet all we have are pathetic descriptions of magnetism, but not a, a single logical or rational explanation of what magnetism actually is. Certainly so further still, these absurd particle fantasies of the cult of quantum, as I like to call it, cannot be enjoined by even halfway intelligent minds. Ah, of course, he doesn't believe in quantum mechanics. Do I really need to point out the irony of him using his digital camera and his computer to broadcast his nonsense over the internet to claim that quantum mechanics isn't real? But what's next is going to be fun. Of course, in reality, a field is nothing other than an ether perturbation. Plain and simple, if that man manifests as transverse, longitudinal, or toroidal formation, doesn't matter. We call this zero-point energy the ether, or pure denotative inertia with no Cartesian value. None of this matters. We're talking about the field itself before being empirically manifest as a field modality or ether modality. Be it the ether in stress or strain, the dielectric, or the ether in loss of its inertia. The dielectric field, which is magnetism or self-replicating longitudinal pulse propagation in the case of electromagnetic radiation, which in reality is just a coaxial circuit of transversing electrical magnetic around a longitudinally propagating uh, pulse perturbation. The nature of EM, transverse electromagnetism, which is a coaxial circuit. Now, I have no idea what he is saying here. This is because he isn't, well, saying anything. Uh, but let's start with the beginning. 
A field is nothing other than an ether perturbation. Well, you are in trouble straight away. The ether does not exist. As this video doesn't really have much of my trademark sciencey bits, I will go through the ether for a bit. We start with light being a wave as shown by Huygens. Now, quick sidebar, I'm a Dutch speaker, so I know full well that the correct pronunciation is Huygens. But because the main language for my video is English, I follow the pronunciation that an English speaker would follow. It stops you from looking like a pretentious asshat, and it just flows better. It's uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. This is the Divina Proportione. Now that is a personal gripe I have when it comes to foreign words. It is often just better not to use the completely correct pronunciation if it deviates too much from the expected pronunciation in the language in which you are presenting. It just flows better. Anyway, back to the ether. Huygens described light as a wave, but at the time it was assumed that a medium is required for any wave, and this medium became known as the luminiferous ether. When Maxwell's equations were developed, there was an interesting result, and that is that the speed of light is constant in a given medium. But then Galilean relativity threw a spanner in the works. Constant with respect to what? So one important property was given to the ether, and this is that the ether is in an absolute reference frame. The medium of the ether is the only thing that is truly at rest. And then everyone went about their business quite happily. Until Michelson and Morley did their famous experiments. And if you are talking to a flat earther, they will claim that this showed the earth to be stationary. But what does the null result actually tell us? Well, we have three options. The first is that the earth is stationary. There may be an ether or not. Now, this is not conclusive evidence of the ether then. The second interpretation would be that the ether is always at rest with respect to all observers at the same time. The third is simple. There is no ether. Now, we can think about these results and reconcile them with other information. Firstly, we have other evidence, such as Mars's retrograde motion, which can only be explained by the Earth and Mars both orbiting the Sun. So that's option one, gone. Then we have the ether must be at rest in all reference frames at the same time. Now, this is unphysical, so that's option two, gone. Finally, we reach option three, and this is that the ether doesn't exist, which is sensible because its existence was never more than just a hypothesis. Of course, Einstein then came along and developed special relativity, which is pretty good, and it allows us to predict things like antiparticles, which are now used on a daily basis in rather trivial things like, I don't know, cancer treatment. But of course, Ken doesn't believe in quantum mechanics. Now, the rest of what he just said is nonsense, whether you're trying to crowbar a meaning into it or not. Now, there are a few phrases in there that Mr. Wheeler likes to use a lot. First, we have field modality, and it is very important that we define it and understand what it exactly means. Field modality means nothing. It's not a thing. It's not a phrase. The second is the dielectric field, which also means nothing. It doesn't exist. You can have an electric field across a dielectric material, and this is sometimes referred to as the dielectric field. But this is an electric field. Now, this is all fine example of charlatanism. Ken just spouts out some word salad, which means absolutely nothing. And this is a theme throughout his channel. Whenever he comes to a point where one would naturally expect an explanation of what he means, he will actually just brush it off as being too difficult to explain. Every ancient Greek translator, too, has had a hard time translating incommensurability. I know exactly what the fuck incommensurability is. Explaining it, not so easy. And by the way, I wrote this lecture. This is not extracts from my fourth edition. I wrote this le lecture specifically for the lecture to be presented. Well, obviously, these are all premises uh, included uh, from the fourth edition within this lecture. I did write it specifically um, and openly uh, as the lecture itself, autonomous from the fourth edition of my book. Um, I'm always shocked to hear that uh, Tesla figured this stuff out first, or so-and-so did, like Victor Schellberger or Walter Russell. No, really? I have every book ever written on magnetism, and nobody explains magnetism nor what a magnet is denotatively. Nobody. Now, really? You have every book on magnetism? Holy fuck, you must be rich. All these, these things are not cheap. And can I suggest that you actually read one? 
And if you're saying that no one explains what a magnet is, denotatively, uh, do you know what that word actually means? Denotation means the specific meaning of a word as given by the dictionary. So a magnet denotatively is just a metallic object where in absence of a magnetic field, all the spins are aligned to produce a, a large magnetic field. Of course, you can then go into things like what is spin? What is a magnetic field? What is a material? And demand a denotative meaning for those concepts. And you can then rapidly go down a rabbit hole and you end up asking questions like what is space or what is time? Now, fine, these are interesting questions. Let us know when you have a hypothesis and we'll try and test it. Ken Wheeler seems to stick to the classic electric universe phrase as a description is not an explanation and then derides scientific theory for just giving a description and not an explanation. Now this is ironic because if we suspend disbelief and take his bullshit as correct then actually all he is doing is giving a description, not an explanation. But it is also a complete failure to understand the philosophy of science. Scientific theory aims to create a description of nature not define what nature is, because then you are talking about what reality is. And that becomes problematic as you end up with untestable predictions. If you can't test it, then it has no place in science, and it is philosophy. But anyway, let's move on. I was asking him to find me in Tesla's writings where he defines magnetism, and of course he never does it. By the way, when I'm using the term inertia in this lecture, I want you to understand this is the original denotation of inertia, not the current connotation. Like you're traveling down the road, and we have a certain inertia, if something happens or we change position, that's current connotation of inertia, not the original denotation. We can say uh, the ether or non-Cartesian energy, but the true original definition of inertia it was, as it was in, uh, originally used. Um, no, inertia has always meant the same thing. It amazes the common person's mind to know that while magnets are everything we use today, Honest minds will confess we don't know what magnetism is, nor how action at a distance works. What defines a magnet? What defines what is magnetism? I'll explain all that uh, very shortly here in the coming sections. I'd like you to take a look at these two uh, illustrations. These are uh, uh, underneath the supercell. Over here, we actually have one side of a magnet, or so-called pole. We have the exact same field geometry over here. Now, this is a uh, ring magnet. I've outlined it in white. Now, this is interesting. Ken Wheeler loves to talk about his supercell. It is just two bits of glass with a ferrofluid suspended in some material and then sealed up. It's also known as a ferrocell. TM. He will claim that this directly shows the magnetic field, and unfortunately, no it doesn't. However, it does show some really cool diffraction effects due to ordering of the ferrofluid inside the cavity, or at least that's my hypothesis. In fact, I'm going to leave it here, and I'm going to have a go at making some. It's kind of cool, and I want to see what I can make out of it under a microscope, and then maybe shine some lasers at it for a bit. Until next time, hopefully part two of his lecture series is a bit more uh, interesting. But uh, until then, I would like to take a moment to thank my patrons who are Thomas Miller, Walter Bislin, Johnny Ragadu, Kevin Dedman, Paul Schnoos, Stringer News One, MC Toon, Stan Zaystef, Cy Blacklock Hughes, Michelle Randall, Ugly German Truths, Kai Broking, and Steelman. Now, if you are a patron and you are not on the list, then I am very sorry. This is actually me speaking to you from the past as I recorded this in early December. I will give you a shout out in the description if I remember. If you want to support me financially, then that would be greatly appreciated as it will help me maintain this channel and support my beer and snacks whilst I'm writing up my thesis in magnetism. But that was it from me and thank you for watching and until next time.